Hey all, Glenn Kirshner here. Welcome to episode two of the Jeffrey Epstein case, A Prosecutor's Perspective. Um, today's episode I'm calling The Backstory. Uh, if you'll recall in the first episode, we started with the day Jeffrey Epstein was found dead in his cell. We talked about how Attorney General Bill Barr virtually sprinted to the nearest camera to try to convince everybody that Jeffrey Epstein had killed himself before Epstein's body was even cool, before there was any investigation conducted, Bill Barr is out there trying to sell us all on suicide. We talked a little bit about the autopsy and how the findings of the forensic pathologist regarding a broken hyoid bone, the bone uh, in the throat right above the Adam's apple, the fractured thyroid cartilage in two places, those findings were not really consistent with a jail cell hanging, what, what's called a low velocity hanging. Um, we're gonna talk more in the next episode about the crime scene, about the, um, uh, the photographs and the documentation that was done of what Jeffrey Epstein's cell looked like and some of those photos have been made available to the public. So we're gonna go through the crime scene or the death scene um, in the next episode. What I wanna tackle today is the backstory. And here's what I want to do. I want to talk about the non-prosecution agreement, the agreement that the U.S. attorney in Florida entered into with Epstein and his lawyers, promising not to prosecute him for a whole bunch of federal sex crimes he committed in the early to mid 2000s. And we're going to talk about how not just unusual, but how unprecedented and frankly, how wrong that non-prosecution agreement is. I will admit folks that I'm almost hesitant to take you through that non-prosecution agreement because it is unlike anything I ever saw in my 30 years as a prosecutor. I've spoken with many of my friends who are former career prosecutors. It is unlike anything they've ever seen. And frankly, when any prosecutor or former, former prosecutor reads it, it makes our blood boil because it's just not the way prosecution or non-prosecution agreements are supposed to work. It's so one-sided. It gives everything to Epstein and it takes everything from the victims in the case. It deprives them of justice at every turn. As I take you through the terms of the agreement, here's what I would ask you all to do if you'll indulge me. Think of this plea agreement as Jeffrey Epstein's lawyer, lawyers draft the entire agreement up and then they blindfold the United States attorney and they slide the agreement under his nose and they say, just sign it. You don't need to know what's in it. Of course, that's not what happened. The U.S. attorney at the time, Alexander Acosta, please remember that name because justice better come for him. He, uh, he has basically been run out of the Trump administration. Um, he was uh, appointed as labor secretary by Donald Trump until all of this Epstein insanity became public and he basically had to resign in shame. He needs to be held accountable beyond just having to resign from a cabinet position for what he did for Jeffrey Epstein and to Jeffrey Epstein's many young victims. Um, but I'm gonna take you through the, some of the terms of this non-prosecution agreement and just ask you to indulge me because none of this is normal. None of this is appropriate. None of this is acceptable. It's all dead wrong, but this is the non-prosecution agreement that then U.S. Attorney Acosta entered into with Jeffrey Epstein's lawyers. First of all, it talks about how it looks like Jeffrey Epstein will be prosecuted by the state authorities in Florida for solicitation of prostitution. So for whatever reason, the U.S. Attorney's Office in Florida agreed to enter into a non-prosecution agreement for the following crimes. And I want to take you through some of what the FBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office had uncovered about Jeffrey Epstein's conduct between 2001 and 2007. This non-prosecution agreement was signed by Jeffrey Epstein 
in 2007. I believe it was September. Here are some of the crimes Jeffrey Epstein was alleged to have committed. Number one, he knowingly and willfully conspired with others to persuade, induce, or entice minor females to engage in prostitution in violation of federal law. Number two, he knowingly and willfully conspired with others to travel in interstate commerce for the purpose of engaging in illicit sexual contact with minor females. Number three, using a facility to knowingly persuade, induce, or entice minor females to engage in prostitution in violation of federal law. Number four, traveling in interstate commerce for the purpose of engaging in illicit sexual conduct with minor females in violation of federal law. Number five, knowingly rec recruiting and enticing uh, young girls under the age of 18 to engage in commercial sex acts in violation of federal law. These are crimes that Jeffrey Epstein, according to this paperwork, was involved in committing between 2001 and 2007. I haven't added up the maximum penalties associated with all these crimes. I don't even know how many times he is alleged to have done these various things over those six years. Suffice it to say, one of these crimes I did look up, it carries 30 years in prison, up to 30 years. These are de facto life sentences. This is life sentence after life sentence for the crimes that he apparently committed and that U.S. Attorney Acosta gave him a pass for. And it goes on to read that R. Alexander Acosta, United States Attorney for the Southern District of Florida, enters into this non-prosecution agreement for Jeffrey Epstein. He has to agree to plead guilty to one count of solicitation of prostitution in Florida State Court. And he entered, I believe, a second uh, relatively minor charge, a plea of guilty in state court. Um, in order for him to get a pass on all of these federal crimes we just went through. I will tell you in that state court case, he did end up pleading guilty and he got a sentence of 13 months, but with work release. So during the day, he would go to his posh office or perhaps his cushy home and would basically report back to uh, a jail in Florida and would have to sleep there, kind of like a hotel with bars, you know, bars, not drinking bars. Um, so this sentence seemed to be little more than an inconvenience to Jeffrey Epstein. Some of the other provisions of this non-prosecution agreement are bizarre beyond words. I'm going to take you through some of it. Please remember what I said. It's like Jeffrey Epstein's lawyer's drafted this up and then blindfolded the U.S. attorney. Of course he didn't, but that's the only way I can convey how inappropriate these terms of a non-prosecution -prosec agreement are. I'm going to read paragraph 7. It says that the prosecutors shall provide Epstein's attorneys with a list of individuals um, identified as his victims after Epstein signs this agreement. and in consultation with and subject to the good faith approval of Epstein's lawyers, the U.S. attorney, the prosecutors, will select a representative for the victims, a lawyer, who shall be paid by Epstein. And then it goes on to set out in a lot of dense legal jargon how these lawyers who would be handpicked by the prosecutors those names would be provided to Epstein's lawyers to see if they were appropriate um, as far as Epstein and his lawyers were concerned. And if so, they would be appointed to Epstein's many young female victims with a view toward Epstein basically paying them off. It goes through a lot of dense legal jargon about civil suits and settlements and um, it, it, it's 
inexplicable beyond words because prosecutors don't pick lawyers for victims for future civil litigation. That's not what we do. It's not part of our practice. And if we did it, we certainly wouldn't give the bad guy and his lawyers veto authority over what attorneys we picked to represent the minor female victims in future civil litigation. Anybody ever heard of the term conflict of interest? Letting Epstein's lawyers and Epstein say yay or nay to lawyers that were going to represent his many young female victims? You can see I'm struggling here, folks, because none of this is normal. None of this makes sense to prosecutors. None of this is the way criminal justice works. And I know what you're all saying, criminal justice doesn't work. And you know, I can't disagree with you. It often does work, but we really have our work cut out for us to reform and repair everything that the Acostas and the Bill Bars of the world have done to degrade, if not destroy, our criminal justice system at the expense of victims. And in this case, child victims. There are other provisions that are equally um, infuriating. For example, paragraph nine, U.S. Attorney Acosta is careful to make sure he protects Epstein completely by saying, uh, if Epstein signs this, it's not a confession. It's not an admission of guilt that he did anything wrong. Yeah, thank you, U.S. Attorney Acosta, for representing the interests of the defendant, Jeffrey Epstein, not the interest of Jeffrey Epstein's victims, turning the whole process on its head. There are one or two other provisions that I want to talk about. Paragraph 13, you ready? The parties anticipate that this agreement will not be made part of the public record. That's the let's bury it from public view paragraph. That's the anti-transparency paragraph because if you're going to do this kind of dirt for Jeffrey Epstein and if you're going to victimize the young victims all over again, you sure don't want the public finding out about it, do you? And then uh, I'm going to hit one more, and it is immunity for Jeffrey Epstein's co-conspirators who aren't even a party to this agreement. And it reads, stay with me, in consideration of Epstein's agreement to plead guilty and to provide compensation to the victims in the manner described above, if Epstein successfully fulfills all of the terms and conditions of this agreement, the United States, the prosecutors, also agree that we will not institute any criminal charges against any potential co-conspirators of Epstein, including but not limited to, put a pin in that, we're going to come back to it, granting immunity to co-conspirators of Epstein, including but not limited to Sarah Kellen, Adriana Ross, Leslie Groff, or Nadia Marcinkova. Further, upon execution of this agreement, the federal grand jury investigation will be suspended into all of Epstein's crimes and the crimes of his co-conspirators. It'll be shut down. It'll be shuttered. It'll be killed and all pending federal grand jury subpoenas will be held in abeyance. They'll be pulled back, withdrawn. We won't seek any additional evidence of crimes by Jeffrey Epstein or his co-conspirators. I mean, can you see why I warned you that you should view this as if the prosecutor had a blindfold on and didn't read it and it was drafted by Jeffrey Epstein's lawyers? Unfortunately, that didn't, ha that didn't happen. Acosta did read it and he signed it. And it is a travesty and an outrage to Jeffrey Epstein's many junior female underage 
victims. And let's go back to where I said put a pin in it because it's one thing to grant immunity to say we're not going to prosecute any of your co-conspirators, Mr. Epstein, don't worry, we got you. And they name a series of them and they say, including those people, but not limited to them. What does that mean? Are there other co-conspirators to be named in a future trade? What, for an outfielder? I'm speechless. I'm not often speechless, as you all know. I like to run my mouth. You should have seen my juries. I would go on and on and on in the well of the court, fighting for justice, always reluctant to sit down for fear that I forgot something or got something wrong. Um, what's wrong here is every aspect of this non-prosecution agreement. Folks, I don't know what it's a product of. I don't know if it's a product of cronyism or elitism, favoritism, compromise, bribery. I have no idea. I know it's not normal. It's so far. It's 8,000 miles from normal. And it's a travesty. A couple of things that I'll ask you to keep in mind as we move toward episode three. Um, why did Acosta, the U.S. attorney, enter into this non-prosecution agreement with Jeffrey Epstein and his lawyers. We're going to try to work on that as we make our way through the series. And then the other question that I have always had since the moment Jeffrey Epstein was arrested by the Southern District of New York federal prosecutors in July of 2019 for crimes he committed 12 and 14 years earlier, that some of them seem to be covered by this non-prosecution agreement, why would federal prosecutors go back all those years, dredge up old charges, charges that had been the subject of a non-prosecution agreement, and bring those charges anew 12, 14 years later? Now, I'm glad the Southern District of New York chose to do that and fight for these underage victims, albeit all these years later. I welcome that. I embrace that. You know, it's never too late to do justice by victims. But was there another agenda in arresting Jeffrey Epstein all these years later for those old crimes? Was it just wanting to vindicate the rights of the victims or was there something else at play, something more nefarious? And did it have anything to do with um, Jeffrey Epstein ending up dead in his jail cell? We're going to try to tackle those questions and more as we move through this, these, um, uh, these episodes of the Jeffrey Epstein case, a prosecutor's perspective. Um, I have to sign off with, as always, please stay safe, friends. Please stay coronavirus free. And I look forward to talking with you all again soon.